Home of the Blizzard was the name of the book that uh, that Mawson published on his adventures. Wind was a continuous factor. In fact, something I found out only this afternoon reading a paper by Mawson that was published in 1935 was that uh, he actually thought that Antarctica would be a great place to set up a wind farm in 1935. That's actually looking ahead. The same paper is talking about how properly managed the whale industry could continue forever. But weather, of course, is a major uh, feature of uh, Antarctic expeditions because it is so different from everywhere else in the world, and yet it governs so many of the world's major weather cells. So to, tonight, to talk to us about the Antarctic weather and climatology, uh, we have Martin Crowe, who's a retired meteorologist from the Australian Bureau of, of Meteorology, and he actually spent a season at Davis Base 2002-2003. Would you please welcome to stage Martin Crowe. Good evening. Yes, I spent the summer of 2002 to 2003 at Davis Base as a weather forecaster. Davis was the captain of uh, Mawson's ship, Captain John King Davis, commonly known as Gloomy. <laughs> that ship, the steam yacht Aurora, was not a large vessel, and Mawson wrote about the scarcity of loading space, and I quote from his book, The Home of the Blizzard. The roof of the chart house, which was an extension of the bridge proper, did not escape, for the railing offered facilities for lashing sledges, Besides, there was room for tide gauges, meteorological screens, and cases of fresh eggs and apples. Somebody happened to think of the space unoccupied in the meteorological screens, and a few fowls were housed therein. So meteorological equipment doubled as a chook house on the journey south. <clears throat> there were some weather-related problems as uh, Mawson and his crew journeyed south, but I'll skip to their arrival in Commonwealth Bay, and Mawson describes the weather as he landed at Cape Denison. The sun shone gloriously in a blue sky as we stepped ashore on a charming ice key. The first to set foot in Antarctica, on the Antarctic continent, between Cape Adair and Gaussburg, a distance of 1,800 miles. This was the 8th of January. It looked like a very pleasant place to set up camp, given that it was in Antarctica. But first impressions can be misleading. Unloading their gear took a week and a half because the wind kept whipping up the sea. On uh, the Aurora left on the 19th of January and the men began building their hut, equipment was set up and meteorological observations started on the 1st of February. And Mawson noted, early in February, after having experienced nothing but a succession of gales for nearly a month, I was driven to conclude that the average local weather was much more windy than in any other place in Antarctica. And February continued windy. Maybe March would be better. Note, the average wind speed for the whole of March was 78 kilometres an hour. April, the average wind speed for the whole of April, 82 kilometres an hour. Well, maybe it gets better. The average wind speed for the whole of May, 108 kilometres an hour. To put these figures in perspective, the Bureau of Meteorology issues strong wind warnings for coastal waters when the wind speed reaches 46 kilometres an hour, and gale warnings for ocean waters at 63. And it issues storm warnings for speeds of 89 kilometres an hour. So the average wind for May 1912 was about 20 kilometres an hour stronger than the threshold for storm force winds. Mawson commented on the importance of weather to his team at Cape Denison. Among societies privileged to see the daily paper and to whom diversity and change are as the breath of life, the weather is apt to be tabooed as a subject for conversation. To us, it was the all-engrossing theme. The man with the latest harebrained theory of the causation of the wind was accorded a full hearing. The lightning calculator who drifted the annual tonnage of drift snow sweeping off a deli land was received as a futurist and thinker. Evidence on the great topic accumulated day by day, month by month. Yet there was no one without an innate hope that winter would bring calm weather, or springtime at least must be propitious. Again, no, the average wind for the entire year was over 80 kilometres an hour. These days, much more is known about the weather in Antarctica, 
Uh, much of that continent is over 300 metres above sea level, and it's now known that the winds start as catabatic winds, cold, dense air flowing downwards off the heights, accelerated by gravity, and reaching speeds of 200 kilometres an hour at times, sometimes more. The highest wind speed recorded in Antarctica was from the French base du Mont de Ville, which is quite near Cape Denison, 327 kilometres an hour. The winds are deflected to the left of their path by the rotation of the Earth, so that when they're funneled down valleys, it's windier on the western side than the eastern side. And then when they reach the coast, they interact with the low-pressure systems offshore. These low-pressure systems have clockwise circulation, so the usual uh, wind direction near the Antarctic coast is an easterly. And for those who don't know, a an easterly wind comes from the east. The Antar Antarctic ice plateau descends to sea level very close to Mawson and Casey. As a result, they're both windy places. Davis, on the other hand, is in the Vestfold Hills, an ice-free area with the ice plateau uh, something like 20 kilometres or more inland. The result of this is that Davis, although it's further south than the other two bases, is both warmer and less windy than Mawson and Casey. Expeditioners staying at Mawson and Casey sometimes refer to Davis as the Riviera of the South. <laughs> I could never decide whether they were being derogatory or envious. Probably both. During the summer I was at Davis, two wind turbines were built at Mawson to use the energy of those catabatic winds howling down off the plateau. And... Are we getting anything? And that's one of them with Mount Henderson in the background. And you can see the ice plateau coming down very close to, um, to Mawson. Uh, another fact about the weather in Antarctica that most people don't know is that as well as being the highest and the windiest continent, it's also the driest. Um, it may be snowing most days in the interior, but most days the snow's just blowing from one place to another. And this picture here is from a helicopter about 2,000 feet above the surface, and those little wiggly lines, if you can make them out, is the snow blowing in the wind. Um, it's been estimated that um, once snow settles in the interior of Antarctica, it can take 100,000 years for it to move as part of the general transport of ice down to the coast and detach as part of an iceberg. In fact, ice cores from Antarctica have given us an atmospheric record, this is air bubbles in the ice cores, have given us an atmospheric record going back more than 700,000 years. There are some types of weather that are found only in cold places like Antarctica, blizzards for example. To qualify as a blizzard, the wind speed must be 56 kilometres an hour or more, and the snow must reduce visibility to 400 metres or less. In my three months at Davis, I didn't see a single blizzard. Another cold weather phenomenon is whiteout, which is not well understood outside the Arctic and Antarctic regions. You don't need it to be snowing to get whiteout. This is ooh, too far. This is a picture of near whiteout conditions on the Amory Ice Shelf in January 2003. No good showing you a picture of full whiteout because it's all white. If the ground is covered by snow or white ice and the sky is obscured by cloud, even high cloud, then the light is diffused and everything is white. There's no shadows. You can't distinguish anything. Uh, the visibility may be 100 kilometres in the cool, in the clear, clean air of Antarctica, but everything looks white. Pilots won't fly in Antarctica uh, unless it's a matter of life and death because there's no horizon. You can't distinguish a horizon. They can fly on instruments, but it's difficult to fly on instruments. It takes remarkable concentration. Another type of weather that's found only in places like Canada and Greenland and Antarctica is ice fog. This occurs when the air is very dry and clean. At normal temperatures, even for Antarctica, water vapour and water droplets won't freeze unless they have a nucleus to freeze on. But if the air temperature gets very cold, very much below freezing point, then the water vapour will freeze or sublimate uh, in the air, 
uh, causing a fog of tiny ice crystals. And this is what it can look like. Um, the sunlight refracts in strange ways, and it can look very attractive. It's known as diamond dust. Fog, that is normal fog, can occur, it can be uh, quite common in some parts of Antarctica in the summer. What happens is that the, the, um, when sunlight hits a snow surface or a white ice surface, most of it's reflected, but some of it gets absorbed and transformed into heat energy and causes melting. Now, when the wind comes over a cold ice surface and then flows over this relatively warm meltwater surface, it gets warmed and it also gathers a bit of water vapour from that surface. Then it flows on over another cold ice surface, it gets cooled again and that excess water vapour is condensed as fog. And this also happens offshore in the sea ice where you get areas of open sea within the general sea ice um, area. Another peculiarity of Antarctic weather is you don't get thunderstorms. It's just too cold and dry. Actually, there was a thunderstorm observed once at the British Faraday base, but that's north of the Antarctic Circle. I found my work as a weather forecaster demanding, but it was much easier than for people like Madigan, who was with Mawson. I got the, uh, the benefit of the output from computer programs in Australia, the US and Europe, plus weather radar, upper air information from weather balloons, satellite pictures several times a day, and the benefit of the phenomenal amount of weather science carried out in the last hundred years. Jet streams were unknown in 1912, and even the concept of weather fronts was still in the future. And when uh, <coughs> working conditions also were much easier for me than for um, Mawson's lot. Mawson's journey south was made in the steam yacht Aurora, a wooden vessel of 390 tonnes. I, I went south in the Aurora Australis, 3,900 tonnes. Oh, there we are. Um, <clears throat> and this shows the relative sizes of the two vessels. The Aurora Australis was designed for Antarctic conditions and is able to break ice up to four feet thick. The wooden aurora suffered damage as it went south and water got into most places. The aurora australis kept me warm and dry and comfortable. And when I got to Davis, I walked straight into a substantial heated building with bedrooms, a kitchen, a video room and a bar. Mawson and his men were left with a pile of timber and cement and had to build their own huts. Ooh. That's uh, the lounge. Sorry, sorry, the lounge at Davis in um, Christmas Day 2002. I, uh, I was able to use the internet and email. I could send pictures back to my family every day if I wanted. Mawson experimented with early radio technology, had to put up his own masts for antenna, and they soon got blown down by the wind. Antarctica has a vital role to play as far as weather forecasting is concerned. These days it's acknowledged that the weather is a worldwide phenomenon. That is, what happens in one place in the world influences what happens in other places. And the best forecasts nowadays are made with reference to global computer models of the atmosphere. And the bases in Antarctica and the sub-Antarctic islands provide vital information from a huge area of the Earth's surface that would otherwise be a very large void. And Mawson's work in Antarctica enabled Australia to claim a large slice of that continent, and it laid the foundation for a continuing and significant scientific presence there. As a result, Australia has had a strong voice in international decision-making about the future of that large cold and beautiful continent. <laughs>